What's up, guys? It's John Nelson, and this is the Starting Block Podcast. Guys, if you were looking for a show that's going to give you insight into complete athletic development, then you have found the right spot. Guys, our mission here, if you're new to the show, our mission is to help give you the tools to win, whether you're the athlete, the parent, or the coach. There's so much information out there. Everybody's got a show, and that's great, but our goal here is to make it relatable to the athlete, the parent, the coach, not just coach-to-coach talk. And that's what we're about and trying to give you the tools. So if you're new, we appreciate you joining. Thank you. Um, Here's a little bit of a breakdown of how our show works. We're a little different than your standard podcast. So we have multiple shows within the show. The first type of episode that you'll hear from us is going to be a Q&A. That's where myself and my co-host, Chris Scarborough, what's up? Good afternoon. That is where Chris and I will come on, and we will answer the questions that you guys submit to us. You can submit those to us online, or you can submit them on our brand-new website. You can reach us at startingblockpodcast.com. In our email, you can email us there, or you can email us at info at startingblockpodcast.com. So the Q&A is our first type of episode. The other one is going to be a guest interview. That's where we will bring in our colleagues from across the country. It might be strength coaches. It might be performance coaches, therapists, doctors. We'll bring them on, and they're going to share their stories of how they win, what they do with their clients, their patients, and hopefully connect you guys across the country with all these other great coaches that share very similar core values and missions that we have as well here. And then the final episode is going to be that Friday fire fact. Or maybe Saturday sermon. It just kind of depends on when I get to it. And as I always say, Chris, it's 10 to 20 minutes of guided wisdom. A lot of people call it anger. I call it guided wisdom and passion. And, uh, guys, that's not really going to be about exercise theory or rehab theory. It's going to be more of the business side of stuff, some motivational content, something like that, just something to get you thinking about maybe something happened here at the gym or something this week that I wanted to share. That's our show. Yeah, a whole bunch of Johnisms. Yeah, Yeah. I usually throw some type of really – southern type of uh you know that relates to the farm some type of analogy like that um so that's the breakdown of our show the fee for the show we do ask that you please share the show guys come on we bring you this content takes a lot of our time and energy we love to do this but the goal is to help you guys win and so we do ask that you please just subscribe and share the show help get the message out And lastly, I just want to give a shout-out to one of our sponsors, Exercise Unlimited. Exercise Unlimited, guys, remember, they are the largest distributor of new and pre-owned fitness equipment in the Memphis and the Mid-South area. They're locally owned and operated for 23 years. Exercise Unlimited offers a 5,000-square-foot showroom and all the major brands. In addition, they also got a 25,000-square-foot warehouse of high-quality pre-owned fitness equipment. So combined, they've got over 40 years' experience. And, guys, they really are the expert when it comes to equipment. So if you're local, visit them you know, at 387 South Front Street. Or if you're not, visit them online at exerciseunlimited.com. Tell them that John and Chris sent you. You can use the promo code STARTINGBLOCK2023 for any additional discounts as well. So appreciate you guys. Thank you. And now that uh, we've got all the housekeeping stuff done, I think I covered everything, right, Chris? I believe so. All right. Good deal. Let's get to it. As you guys see, that today is a guest interview, and we got Mr. Ricky Stanzi from Gota joining us today. What's up, man? How we doing, guys? Thanks for having me. You bet, dude. You bet. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us. So we're looking forward to talking to you. Now, Gary was on the show a few months ago, all right? So we'll... uh. You, you gotta I got to follow that. There. That's always, I already know. I already know. I got what kind of energy I got to bring. Well, this has got to, yes. got to be better, Ricky. Just, just from my standpoint, I was sick as a dog. Oh, okay. The day that we interviewed Gary. So, you know, I'm, I'm feeling much better. So that good. You'll be in a better <laughs> yeah, frame of mind to, to listen to all yeah. this information. We try to take you, like I said earlier, we take you to every different corner of human movement. So it can, if your mind's not right, it can definitely be taxing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So Gary and I or not Gary, well, Gary and I as well, but Ricky and I met, uh, when I came down to uh, new Orleans to go through the go to lab coursework, I guess that was towards the end of, mm-hmm. end of the summer of 2022. And, um, you know, go has become a huge part of what we do at ELP. And, um, you know, it really, it really opened my eyes personally to just a lot of different things. And, um, like you said, we were talking a minute ago, it's a go is a 
it's a it's a small system, but it's a huge system mm-hmm. as well. And um, so, you know, for the for the coaches and athletes and parents that you know don't know who you are yet, Ricky, I mean, t- tell everybody just a little bit about uh, about how you got involved. In this uh, share a little bit of those uh, football stories too, if you don't mind. Man. Yeah, I mean, that's really, <laughs> I guess, where my my movement journey or you know, um, sort of path to becoming a coach, if you will, in this industry starts is with football. Um, you know, backtrack to 2010, 2011. Uh, just finishing up football at the University of Iowa. I was fortunate enough to play there for three years. I played quarterback, and I was entering into the NFL draft in the 2011 um, season. And so that's when – I'm interrupting yeah. you because you're being pretty humble. You had some pretty <laughs> big wins too, though, man. You took down Penn State. You took down Kirk Cousins. Right? Yeah, we had we had a real <laughs> good run. Like I always tell everybody, we had a really good run game, really good offensive line, um, and an unbelievable defense. And it made my job – a lot easier, but, um, my, you know, up until that point, you know, getting the, the opportunity to play at Iowa, I was always, you know, two sport athlete, played football, basketball, baseball, karate, um, my whole life and, and had always been in athletics had always been inside of, um, you know, a training mindset. My dad was a boxer and he had spent his whole life training. So I always grew up, you know, having a father that was very motivated, um, very disciplined when it came to taking care of his body. Um, and I always saw that, and, and kind of, you know, follow those footsteps as far as being interested in just strength and conditioning as a whole. And so as I went through college, obviously going through that normal, you know, path that, that every athlete will go through in the strength and conditioning world, um, I started to take a, a little more of a, a notice to it, um, you know, post-college when I felt that I had some things I needed to clean up. Um, you know, like you alluded to, we had, we had a lot of success at Iowa. Um, and I was getting ready for the draft, but I still felt like, you know, personally, there were things I needed to clean up in footwork and in my throw, just some more mechanical type stuff. And I think that, you know, question or that sort of vantage point allowed me to start to look a little bit deeper into biomechanics as a whole. Um, that really started with, like I said, that draft process, 2011, I start working with Tom Martinez who is at the time Tom Brady's throwing coach and had been Tom Brady's throwing coach since he was 12. So he had a very, um, you know, good grasp on what it meant to uh, excel at throwing the football. So I wanted to kind of pick his brain and and learn from him. And and he opened the door to, you know, different planes of motion and and what's right, what's wrong and, and how are the great ones doing it? So that kind of uh, put, put me in, in front of a whole new set of tape, if you will, or, you know, different set of questions to start to ask. And, from that point on, I was hooked and it was just kind of slowly. It was a a snowball effect of looking at different disciplines. Um, Obviously it didn't stop there at the throw. I started to explore just strength and conditioning and, and, you know, um, human movement as a whole, looking at Eastern art, Western art, trying to get a better grasp of anything that I thought would help me as a quarterback, help me as an athlete. And um, when I was in the NFL, I was always kind of uh, on that, that cut line. I I struggled uh, with my, with my movement. I struggled with my, my throwing motion. So I was always seeking to find out something that would help push me, you know, over that line of, you know, whatever that struggle line is that those things that you want to work on, what's going to answer that question for me. That was something that, that always bothered me. So uh, that just became a passion. And, and, you know, I spent a lot of years digging at different things, Eastern art, Western art. And it wasn't really until I found Goda was there now a sort of new blueprint to start to examine. And, and, and that was the big, you know, aha moment for me was finally taking what was commonplace for a quarterback or an athlete, which is to use slow motion video, but now to not just use slow motion video for the X's and O's of the football game, but to use the slow motion video for the X's and O's of human movement. And so that presentation from, from Gilly and Gary, and then now looking at that new set of data, that, that new slow motion evidence, uh, it completely changed the way that that I was formatting movement in my mind, and it completely changed the way that I was, you know, going to teach it from that point on. So I want to go back to the the Iowa days for a second. You know, 
I mean, I, I, things have changed, and there's a lot of information. I mean, a lot of information. You guys are out there too, but I feel like just when I think of Iowa football, mm-hmm. like I tend, I tend to think of Iowa weight room. You know, a lot of you know mm-hmm. banging, clanging, squatting, classical type of stuff. And again, it's not a knock on them by any means, but is that really? I mean, kind of what you were exposed to when you were playing ball out there? Yes. And how did that? And how that impact your game? Yeah, it was. Um... You know, I would say pretty much all those Power Five conferences are in that same uh, powerlifting, Olympic lifting modality. Like, that's really the cornerstone of the program is the lift. Um, but right. even before that, I was still in that mode uh, in, high, in high school. <clears throat> I was in that mode seventh and eighth grade leading up to high school. So that was kind of the training. That was the style. Like, if you went to a, a personal trainer in the area, you were most likely doing Olympic lifts, deadlifts combining that with some sort of plyometrics and some sort of stretching. You know, there was just these kind of like this holistic sort of sense around the strength and conditioning industry, but very linear based, you know, straight core bracing was a big concept. Um, linear type movements of flexion, extension, tr- extension, triple flexion, triple extension was, was, you know, harped on um, from, I remember seventh, eighth grade all the way up until Iowa. So yes, it was a very uh, powerlifting based, Olympic lifting based setting, you know, at the time you don't know any different as a, as an athlete, you really don't. And so you go through those modalities, but now looking back on it, being able to see it from the vantage point that I have now, it definitely, you know, shows you that I feel some of the, uh, the athleticism gets zapped because the athlete gets very heavy in the heel. They get very sort of magnetized through the heel, the foot. And like we've shown at Gota, there's really no spring system to be accessed through the heel of the foot. So while you do get strong in place in some of these compound lifts or some of these, you know, famous training models, uh, you start to lose some of that sort of youthful elasticity that you maybe had in high school or leading back to grade school. Um, it's tricky though, because you're, you're getting better experience in the sport. You're getting amazing teaching at the X's and O's, but there's some sort of disconnect there as far as, um, you know, keeping your durability, keeping that spring loaded system as you still get stronger and put on size. So I know that's a big focus for us or was a big focus for us at Iowa. And it's no different across the board at every college. You know, they, an athlete comes in, they're scrawny, they're skinny. They want to put size on them, right? Bigger is better. Bigger is stronger and faster. And so that's sort of the, mo- the modality and the mentality when you get to that next level. So let's let's expand on that. You've already mentioned the ankle, okay, or mm-hmm. the heel. You mentioned. So mm-hmm. let's move up the chain a little bit. So, mm-hmm. what hips, trunk? What are some of the differences there that 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 you'd see from a traditional lifting, Olympic lifting, power lifting, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. compared to what you would now teach? If you were to see the younger Ricky Stanzi, right? <laughs> what would how would you now address you? Yeah, no, that's a great, it's a great question, Chris, because I think like going back to what I was saying about go to presenting a different blueprint, that was the big thing for me is up until the point of go to everything that I'd ever seen about the foot, when it was talking about how that foot should be behaving with the ground, it was always centered around tripod foot, right? You'd have an anchor on the top outside corner, anchor on the top inside corner, and then an anchor at the back of the heel. And that tripod foot would be your stability. Now that's kind of true in your lift. But what happens is when you get into locomotion, you actually lose one of those points. The tripod just becomes the ball of the foot. So the heel point should actually be out of the ground. And you should really just be working off of those two points, which connect the cross that creates, as we know it, the general population knows it, the coaching world, the athletes know it as the ball of the foot. And I think everybody can think of the ball of the foot as that area that feels like, you know, it's almost, it's padded. It feels springy. Um, I always tell this to our athletes, imagine trying to bounce up and down on your heels. And they're like, well, I can't. It's like, okay, now bounce up and down on the balls of your feet. And it, it just, it's instinctive. It's, it's the jump rope. It's everything that's spring loaded. That's um, elastic about our system is accessed through that ball of the foot. So that concept of changing the way that you're going to conceptualize the foot, the way you're going to tra- chain, uh, train the foot is the biggest piece at Gota because it completely changes now how that shin compartment and that thigh compartment above just to kind of put it into a micro view for a second for a second um, to kind of conceptualize this this spiraling mechanism that 
directly sort of, uh, you know, goes against, like we mentioned earlier, the linear concept. So up until that point, you're getting fed a lot of talk of tripod foot, um, linear mechanics of triple flexion extension, right? Viewing the, the ankle as a, that crucial meeting point of the shin and the foot, viewing it as a hinge, right? And so if you're viewing it as a hinge, you're seeing tripod foot, you're, you're interested in a very linear representation of the leg, a very sort of, you know, um, flat footed representation of the foot. And then of course that corresponds with the core bracing above at the torso region. What Gota showed was that actually, no, it's, it's the opposite. It's a, it's a foot platform that's actually heels up because the heel has to be steady because, well, the Achilles is plugged into the heel and the Achilles is centered around a spiraled design. Like the fibers of the Achilles are spiraled and then plugged into the heel. So what that means is the shin compartment and the thigh compartment actually have to create what we would call as a multi-planar turn. And the easiest way that I've sort of conceptualized this or created imagery around this for people is to envision a joystick. So if you envision the way a joystick plays, it has a platform that it sits inside of, the platform holds still, and then the joystick does the movement. Now take that same analogy, that same imagery to your body. The platform for this joystick would be the foot. That's going to hold still. That's going to hold a very rigid, cohesive structure. On two point. That is now. On two point. Yeah, on the ball of the foot, inside ankle bone high, a sort of a half dome arch structure. And I can explain in, in a deeper um, you know, detail why the heel has to be up and why it has to be locked once we kind of get the bigger picture in focus. But just imagine, if you will, a, a rigid, stable foot structure through the ball of the foot, anchoring through the ball of the foot, that now provides a platform for that shin compartment and the thigh compartment, which we are saying are operating like a ball and socket. And it makes perfect sense if you just step back for a second and start at the hip, because nobody will disagree that the hip is a ball and socket. What you have to understand, if the hip's a ball and socket and the knee is just a hinge, that means that that shin compartment, which the shin and the thigh meet, they make the knee. So the knee's health is dependent upon the shin and the thigh's movement but their movement has to be harmonized. So if you've got a, a, a femur bone that's playing like a ball and socket, your shin bone, that tibia fibula comp component with the talus has to correspond to the movement above. So that's the huge, like one of the biggest things that Goat is trying to tell, you, tell everybody is that we got to get the heel up and we actually have to, we can't hold a linear mechanics. We can't hold a kneecap pointing straight we actually have to let the kneecap point outward from the straight foot because if you're looking at it front on as somebody's running at you, their foot holds straight, their second toe points at you, but their kneecap points out of, outside of that. So the, the, what that's telling you is that you've now wound up your shin, you wound up your hip, and it's like a pogo stick, essentially. When you, when you hit down, it loads up, and then it you know just coils and then releases. And so there's actually a coiling action a, a bowing action, as we call it at Gota, that takes place as you load and as you transfer your, your, your pressure or your body weight, your center of mass. And that is completely different than a tripod foot, a piston like, you know, linear presentation of the leg and a core bracing presentation of the torso. So when you start to look at those two camps, well, you know, when you start to go further and you look at the training, the training starts to look very different. Because now you're doing everything heels up, you're doing everything with a straight foot, you're doing everything through the ball of your foot, and now you're trying to feed this spiral pattern, and then you also realize that, well, lifting is going to promote the tripod foot, it's going to promote the core brace, it's going to promote some of these things that you don't really want them in a locomotive or a change of direction setting. Chris, did you have something no, I'm on still, that one? I'm still just trying, no, I'm... I'm uh... <laughs> I was thinking about uh, I took extreme lunging as we were as he was going on, so that was uh, and and mm -hmm. sort of it's little... a it's a lot at once. It's a, that's the toughest part about Goda is that I'm trying to frame a macro. I'm trying to take you from foot compartment to shin mm -hmm. to thigh to torso to upper limb. So there's a lot that's playing out. I if you take a step back and if you were just to see it almost as like an action figure. You know, where it's like, it's the, it's a design, it's a technology, like we say, There's it's designed to function a certain way. So the function would be bow and corner, meaning as you put the foot in the ground, the leg 
it does a spiral out and then it spirals in. So it's like a pogo so stick, this, right? So it's more, it's more spiral than it is. Linear. Okay. So let's, let's discuss that spiral for just a minute. Mm -hmm. So this is where I, this is where my mind was going a second ago. So is this spiral an elastic spiral or is this a muscular? Do you understand the, my question mm -hmm. you know, or is mm -hmm. it some of both? I would say it's definitely got to be a little bit of both. I mean, it's the, it's the big sort of push that you're seeing across the industry from, um, you know, some of the great, um, sort of, you know, authorities on the, on the, on the matter, on the subject would be, I think Dr. Spina from FRC does a tremendous job of highlighting how he calls a bioflow where he's talking about from the skin all the way in is one cohesive structure, essentially. And it's all these compounds add it up slightly different to give you a ligament, to give you a tendon, to give you a bone, to give you a muscle. But when you actually go further, it's all the same compound. Right. So it's one cohesive suit. So to take one piece and say, well, it's this or it's that at Goda, we're like, no, it's everything. So you're not, you know, you're integrating from everywhere as opposed to isolating from somewhere. And so you're, 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 you're always trying to see it as a cohesive suit. Now, I think that there are parts of the system that I would call hotspots where like, they're like big clues as to how this thing's supposed to work. And I think if anybody out there is familiar with the tensegrity model, like a bunk, a buck, Mr. Fuller concept where it's, you know, you have these solid objects that are all interwoven in this sort of like cohesive stretchy suit and those solid objects move and they turn and they, they have sort of this, this, you know, um, sort of path that they're going to work on, but there's an elasticity to the way that path is going to play out. So like if you're looking at the Achilles tendon and you're looking at how it's sewn, it's sewn on a setting to where it's spiraled inward. So the whole leg musculature is spiraled inward just to give you a big picture view. And that is kind of, if it's a Russian doll effect down to the Achilles tendon. So the only way to create cohesion with that Achilles tendon is to turn it outward. If you turn it inward, you make the tissue linear. It's like putting slack into a rope. And so when you put slack into a rope, you can now pull it apart and you could create a shred. Whereas if it's, if it's held steady and it's turning and it's really cohesive, it creates integrity. And then you look up the chain and everybody knows this piece, the IT band. Now, I wouldn't say there's like a literal IT band, but what they've seen is that the fascia gets really thick in certain areas, right? If you look at that, you know, if you typed in musculoskeletal system and you just looked at Google images, you would see these like white spots that get really sort of centralized in the, in the system. And you see them at the lower back, you see them on the outside of the legs and they kind of wrap down into the foot and ankle complex. And so some of those hot spots that speak to this elastic bow would be that IT band, like your IT bands on the outside for a reason. It gets really thick on the outside for a reason, because if you're imagining your thigh bone and your shin bone, if just picture your right leg as you put your foot in the ground. If they turn outward, that means you're almost like laying your thigh bone into this like elastic sort of, you know, safety net. Just picture like a WWE wrestler launching off the ropes where like they take their body and they lean into the ropes and then it kind of has this snapback effect where they can shoot back in. Well, you know, your thigh bone kind of leans into that IT band and your shin bone kind of sets into that Achilles tendon and everything just kind of winds up in like a coil fashion to the outside when you land. And then you look at the backside of our body, it's like a corset. We have this thoracolumbar fascia, this sort of diamond, this really cohesive and strong structure through the pelvis into the sacrum and the lumbar area. And that's another clue, and as far as I'm concerned, to what we call back chain dominance, where when the tail reaches back and the crown reaches forward, along with the heel moving up, now you're in a state of sort of like almost suspension. Like, you, you know, you have this springy system, it's athletic position. Picture any sort of sport that you're gonna get ready to move um, in either direction for. What do you normally do? You, you push your tailbone back, you move the crown of your head forward, you get in this low like squat type of crouching stance and you get very light on your feet as they would say, right? You get into the ball of your foot. That is the unleashing of this spring loaded system at its maximum. So it's as we would call it, just inner ankle bone high, back chain dominant. You set the stage for a springy type of you know motion to take place throughout your column, column just being 
either side of the body. And if you look at the column as a ball and socket, like a joystick, then it's much easier to see, oh, it's a joystick. It's not going to be a piston. It's not going to be a hinge. It's going to be more of a rotary, more of a turning type of mechanism. And you can look at it from the skeletal structure, or you could look at it from a, you know, a fascial structure or a muscular structure, however you wanted to view it. I think you'd still come back around to this, this spiral type um, design playing out in the system. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt. I mean, even if you measure forces mm -hmm. using whatever techniques that you use to measure it, even on what you would consider linear movements, you know, squat, whatever, yeah. there's a lot more rotation going on than anybody ever realizes, even when they measure them with EMG yeah. or whatever else. But another in interesting point that you made was there is no Achilles tendon separate from the calf, separate from it. The tissues inside the calf muscles become the Achilles tendon, yes. which becomes Correct. the plant, plantar fascia, mm -hmm. which becomes, you know, things become, <laughs> they, they, yeah, they're a great way different it. tissues. All you have to do is look mm -hmm. at any, uh, you know, I, I had cadaver anatomy back in college. They yeah. are the same structure. They just, the Achilles tendon is j just comes directly out of all those tissues that surround all those muscles in the calves, which came from, you know, up further up the chain and so on. So, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. I mean, it all makes sense that your, you know, tissues become it's not, they're not a bunch of individualized separate pieces. Right. And then that, that has direct implication on then, you know, the training that is going to follow afterwards. Right. So if I'm in a modality where I feel like, well, it's, it's leg day, it's back day, it's bicep day, it's um, extension day, it's flexion day. It's a, you can see how now you're taking isolated ranges, isolated muscles, isolated structures, and you're pulling them out of a matrix and thinking that, well, I can just hyperanalyze one and not affect mm -hmm. the other. Well, that's not how a tensegrity model right. works. It's a butterfly effect. One movement down at the foot reverberates up to, you know, the head and the neck. And so speaking back to that measuring out movement, like you said, if you were to look at it from a um, computer, you know, data point um, uh, standpoint, if they were to take and they were to put those, those, those nodals on every single spot and they were to measure out the planes of motion, when somebody goes to land, all planes of motion are going to be represented. It, it would never just be a reading. There would never just be math on the sagittal plane or math on the right. frontal plane or math on the transverse. You would see you would see decimal points sporadically hit for the transverse plane, the sagittal plane, and the frontal plane. What we're saying is that's real movement. Real movement is going to be multiplanar, meaning it's not one-dimensional. It's not even two-dimensional. It is a three-dimensional sort of, you know, action taking place <clears throat> in each, to make it simple, the limbs and the torso. So the limbs and the torso are going to be moving multiplanar, meaning yes, there will be some sagittal movement, but yes, there will be some frontal movement. And yes, there will be some transverse. Now, if you can combine all those and you can see them happening simultaneously, what you would be seeing is a spiral. So when you combine frontal and sagittal and transverse, it moves in a toroidal type spiral. So there is a down back out and a up forward in type of component to our movement to really any toroidal type structure, any pivot point energy system, which is like a hurricane, a tornado, there's a point energy moves in a toroidal fashion around that point, meaning it's got representation from all three planes simultaneously to make a cohesive movement. Well, that same multiplanar type of you know, blueprint that would be out there in nature is in your DNA. It's in your design. And so the clues are there. They're inside the structures. It's just from a, however it was presented to us at the first, you know, onset, maybe it's because bodybuilding was huge and people started getting into training through bodybuilding. And so we had a, a an isolated mindset of, well, the pec looks good when it's bigger. So let's just train that. The delt looks good. And the next thing you know, we start chopping it up. I also think that Cadaver science is great and cadaver science is necessary, but cadaver science is needed to be studied alongside movement science, meaning I've got to have a, a National Geographic type approach to this question at the same time, meaning if I want to study a bear, yeah, it's good to you know 
take the bear and, and, and have a look underneath the hood at what's inside that cadaver, but I'd also want to see it move and see it behave in its you know, element. So go to saying the same thing. Take a look at the body as it just moves, as it plays out, and as it stays durable, and then take that information, combine it with the cadaver information, like the Achilles being sewn on a spiral inwards, like the thickening of the fascia on the outside, like the different clues that are inside the design, put those two together and you'll start to see the pattern that's supposed to be there. Not, not what we want to do. And I think we've done a lot of what we want to do. Like we say core brace. Well, Fryette's second law shows you that the spinal segments, the facet joints literally have a law that they don't play like that. They don't behave in that manner. So we don't get to decide that, oh, I want to, I want to, I want to brace the facet joints. Well, they don't brace. That's not what they, that's not what they're designed to do. Now, you being a conscious being, you can do all sorts of stuff that you want to do, but it doesn't mean that there won't be a collateral damage for doing those types of things to the joints over time. We know it's a resilient system, but it will break down over time when I start to feed it the wrong you know, the, Now, but just by what you've said, you can now begin to see how important things like muscle spindles become. You know, and being able to send that very mm -hmm. rapid signal, you know, one chain yep. to the next. I mean, so that everything gets the okay, okay. The ankle wants wants the body to do this, so that next joint up's got to be right behind. It. It's got to be in coordination. And if that system is dampened by, you know, you mentioned bodybuilding type training a minute ago, which would dampen mm -hmm. that system, which is part of the reason part of the reason why it could be less than effective for athletics, in my opinion. Mm -hmm would be because it truly dampens that system of the way the body wants to move as a unit versus, versus, uh, you know, just lift, <laughs> you know, you know, right. So it's, right. you know, you can see where that coordination with, like I said, with the spindles, with the Golgi tendons and those types of things would mm -hmm. be absolutely critical that we train movement and not train individual muscle. <laughs> and I, Absolutely. I think that there's, and there's also this, like I said, this, this observation type of mentality where you're almost, you're genuflecting back to the design, you're genuflecting back to the creation inside of nature. You're looking at it as an observer, not telling it what to do, letting it shows you what it does, what it, what it, what it's built to do. When we look at our body, we're movers. Like we move, we can lift. We have the ability to lift, but the design is to move forward. And I always use this sort of imagery for people when I'm trying to explain it. Picture the hunter-gatherer model, because that's really where, you know, if you want to boil it back to like, well, what's my skill set in the wild? What even led to us to be able to sit in front of these phones and talk about this stuff? Well, we became an apex predator, not by deadlifting, not by Olympic lifting. We, came, we became the apex predator by gathering as a team and using our locomotive qualities, right? Walk, jog, run, throw, swing, strike. Those are the things that we use, the skills that we use to take down an animal. We are like the car in the sense that the car is designed to go forward. Nobody would disagree with this, but it does have a reverse gear, but it's designed to go forward, right? You're going to spend 98% of your day driving forward gear. But it's nice to have a reverse gear, just like it's nice to be able to put your hands on that box that's below you and pick it up. It's one of the benefits of being bipedal. It's one of the benefits of having a dexterity model and being able to pinch your thumb and your index together, right? There's a lot of things that go around, I believe, the base design, which is walk, jog, run, throw, swing, strike, rest on the ground. I think our design is very simple. And I think the more that we look at it in its natural setting, like Gilly did, Jose Bosch did, the founder of Gota, when he looked at the indigenous cultures, that was a big clue for him was look at the indigenous, look at the crawling baby. They'll probably give us a really good vantage point for how it's designed to work when nobody tells it what to do. Well, when we look at that model, we see a lot of that. Walk, jog, run, throw, swing, strike, rest on the ground. Now, for some reason, there was a disconnect when we got to the training of that system. We were no longer walk, jog, run, throw, swing, strike, rest on the ground for the training. That was kind of relegated to the sport. The training now became reverse gear. So it's almost like, you know, I'm this, this car driver and I'm going to be racing the car in forward gear, but I'm spending all my time at the track driving in reverse. 
And it's kind of counterproductive when you stop and think about it that way. But if I'm a locomotive athlete, if I'm built to walk, jog, run, throw, swing, strike inside of my sport, but then I get into my training and now I'm not using any of the qualities of drive gear in my training. I'm actually using the qualities of reverse gear in my training. I'm using the qualities of the lift. I'm enhancing those qualities of the lift. I am getting stronger. I am getting faster, but I'm also getting stronger and faster in a reverse pattern. Now, the problem with that is that what we observed off of that reverse pattern was big <clears throat> catastrophic injuries. So it was a question of, okay, yeah, maybe the pattern changes in the lift, but is that bad? Well, yeah, it is bad because if you look at this deadlift right here, and you look at this Olympic lift right here, and you look at this linear lunge right here, the qualities that you'll see playing out at the foot and at the ankle, at the spine, at the, all the different biomarkers up the chain, you would see those same qualities play out in a non-contact ACL, in a non-contact Achilles. You would see those qualities showing up in somebody that had a meniscus repair, somebody that is you know, on deck for a hip surgery. So these behaviors that were associated with a body falling apart, Gilly noticed that those behaviors that are associated with joint replacements, that are associated with ACL tears, Achilles tears, they seem to look exactly like the behaviors that I see in that one rep of an Olympic lift, that I see in that one rep of so a deadlift. I'm gonna, so I'm going yep. to interrupt you there because I was, at, I was waiting for you to bring up that car <laughs> analogy because admittedly I've stole that from <laughs> it's you. A good one. I use it all the time. Uh, oh, it's a great one. Yeah, great job. So where when you have – an athlete or a parent that approaches you and you know they have the idea that strength is the key to everything i've got to be strong in the gym how how do you like to approach that and, and explain to them how you delineate between the two and i let me circle back to an example this morning is i had one of uh, one of my younger eighth grade kids in here um and he was trying to explain to me how Shohei otani was deadlifting 600 pounds. And he was trying to argue like, hey, well, if he can perform at that level, yet he's doing 600 pound mm -hmm. deadlifts, why don't I need to do that, do mm -hmm. that as well? No, it's a great question. And I, I try to get people to understand that strength is not just available through a deadlift. So I think that you can be strong in a deadlift, but you can get strong from a multitude of ways. And what you want to be strong at is you want to be strong at durable behavior. So you want to have the foot and the ankle be strong inside of a durable behavior. Now, Shoei Otani is also a guy that, if I'm not mistaken, has had some elbow problems. He's also a guy that has lost some of his, his cornering ability. He still has a lot of stuff that if you looked at him, you'd be like, ooh, that looks pretty Gota. There's a lot that pops there from a Gota perspective, sure. but there's also stuff that's missing from a Gota perspective. And if something's missing, for an athlete that's going to take his system to the highest RPMs, I predict that something will fall apart because if you're going to push it to the highest RPMs in a fragile type of setting, well, now it's just a Russian roulette with the system. So we try to get people to understand that you can have strength, you can have speed absent of durability. So a WOTA pattern that is displayed, look at the Olympic lift. Nobody would say, well, that's weak. I mean, these guys are hurling extreme amounts of weight over their head and catching it in a squat and then lifting up. No one's going to say that that movement is a weak, inherently weak movement. Look at the high jump. It's a literal reverse pogo stick of the single leg. Nobody will sit there and say that's a weak movement. They're jumping off one leg backwards <laughs> over and it's in extreme height. So we are explosive creatures by nature. Okay. So I could be strong. I could be fast in a fragile type of pattern where it's like a Russian roulette. It's explosive, but it could be destructive. You could also get strength and speed just by attacking the lens of durability. So if something is durable, you've already implied that it is strong. If I've got this durable piece of leather. I'm like, this thing's strong. It's got longevity to it. It's going to last. I want that same quality for the athlete's structure, the athlete's system. I want to get across to them that Look, you're not in a one rep max system. You're not in the life is not a one rep max. It is a marathon. The season is a marathon. The game is a marathon. Your system has to be able to match that test of a marathon. You have to be looking for longevity. You should really 
only be setting your compass towards durability and at the very least, don't get hurt. Because at the very least, if you don't get hurt in your respective sport, that allows you not only more time to play in a game, but allows you more time to practice. And if there's more time to practice, there's more time to develop skill. And if there's more time to develop skill, then more likely you'll be on the field to get more reps and get more experience and just keep churning out that skill set that you're trying to develop. So your best ability is availability. It is set at every single level from grade school up into the pros. When it gets to nut cutting time, you know, when, when all the shit's done, when the, the, the fun games is over and it's that first day of camp and you're sitting in that meeting room, coaches look across the table at you and they say, your best ability is availability because now it's the time of put up or shut up. If you get hurt now, guess what? There's another guy that's waiting to go in and you're going to be out. So at the very least, when it really comes down to it, if you're a 10 year old kid that's into baseball and you're on your travel league team, your biggest enemy right now would be an injury. So before you even think about being strong or being fast, you have a duty to take care of the durability that is needed for your sport. So that's how I've looked at it is like, well, before I'm even strong or before I'm even fast, I got to make sure I don't fall apart. And then if you look at it from that vantage point, well, we've already shown that you could be strong and fast inside ankle bone high. You could be strong and fast inside ankle bone low, but you'll be able to make it to the last game of the season inside ankle bone high. I don't know if you're going to make it to the last game of the season inside ankle bone low. The, the, the evidence would suggest that most likely you're going to get injured. To, to further expand on the argument where I get this from the kids a lot, well, so-and-so is doing it. Look, Shohei Otani, if he wanted to drive a unicycle, I bet you he'd be good at that, okay? Like, these are world-class athletes, guys. They can do whatever they want. They are the top. They are the premier. They are... If you're in a tribe and you're Shoei Otani, he's leading you. He's leading the Karubos. He's the guy with the finest point arrow. He's the guy that's the expert marksman in the tribe. Every tribe had these had this guy, and he was the expert hunter. And he was looked at as the alpha, right, inside an apex predator tribe. Well, the alpha is the guy that can lead, the guy that can throw, the guy that is the expert marksman, because that's what really makes the kill. We've actually set up our sports around this concept, right? The throw, the swing is football. It's become a passing game and everything's centered around that quarterback component. Baseball is obvious. Even basketball, it's around the shot, right? It's around who can create the best shot for themselves, who can go and be an expert marksman and put that ball inside the rim. So the game is centered around this sort of ability um, to be a hunter-gatherer, to be a an expert, you know, stud with the ball and then protecting that guy that can do that or enhancing that guy's ability. But you have these sort of rock stars in sports. And yeah, like if you take Saquon Barkley and you put him underneath the squat rack, I'm not surprised that he can put up numbers. I mean, he's a freak. Of course he can. It doesn't speak to the Olympic lift. It just speaks to Saquon Barkley's athleticism as a human being more so than anything. Yeah. And so I, w- I want to segue that with, you know, you talk about having the capacity to move, having the capacity to be healthy, which ultimately leads to more time to perfect mm-hmm. your skill. Now, I've, I've gone on record in saying what turned me on to go to what clicked for me was one of our pitchers, Brady Tiger, was one of our pitchers here in high school. And we hit 99 and an unofficial 100 miles an hour in high school. And then he goes to the SEC, and he's done amazing things there. But the question always stuck in my mind, why is this kid, although he had a great work ethic and everything, why was he able to do this but somebody else who maybe Mm. worked just as hard, practiced as hard, couldn't accomplish the same thing? And then that's where, you know, I got turned on to you guys, and it all clicked for me. I say all that because I also am on record saying that I am a firm believer that mechanics are a byproduct of movement. I firmly believe that. I firmly believe one of the worst things that's happening to our youth is we are forcing them into these mechanical patterns that they don't have the capacity to handle. And so I would like to hear your thoughts, especially Mm -hmm. as, as a thrower, as an overhead athlete, your thoughts on movement being your mechanics being a byproduct of your movement and how you evaluate that, especially with a throwing athlete, whether it's a pitcher. Yeah, no, that's spot on. I mean, there were certain times, like I could think back to 2015, 2014, when I'm going through the grind of, you know, trying to stay on a roster and trying to figure out my throw. And 
I mean, I'm trying every different thing from how I'm holding it, all these different mechanical adjustments. And no matter what I asked myself to do, I didn't have the capacity to pull off that move at that time. So there's sort of a little bit of both, I think, that has to go on for a throw athlete. And, and I, this is where it's tough for the athletes is they're all about velo. It's all about like the fastest throw, the hardest throw. And so everything wants to be as fast and as vicious as they can get it. Whereas like yep. I try to get the quarterbacks to have like a Tai Chi yoga type mindset. Whereas like if you can do it really slow and controlled, you'll be able to snap your fingers and do it really fast. But nobody has this patience to slow down and to really refine and understand and control the movement. If you look at some of the most explosive athletes in the world and they don't get their due, their due credit, but the Shaolin monks, if you go watch Shaolin monks move, you will watch that when they train, it starts as an isometric, then it moves into a very slow and controlled, precise understanding of the movement. Then it just ramps up to a, a speedy type of like snap their fingers and these dudes are bouncing around like monkeys all over the place. And it's incredible what they can do. But we've sort of tried to take Goda and give it back to the system the same way. So we take you, we put you in an isometric setting. So the same qualities that I want to have from a mechanic standpoint need to be in my movement. Like you're saying, like the way that you're walking is going to reflect in your mechanics as a thrower, as a pitcher, as a quarterback, 1000%. I've got quarterbacks that I work with. They walk with crooked feet because they walk with crooked feet. It blocks their hips from cornering. I could tell them a thousand times over to move their heel away, move their heel away until I stop and I slow down and I kind of take the ball out of their hands and I actually rehabilitate the way that foot and that ankle are operating amongst each other. I'm just kind of pissing in the wind a little bit with what I'm saying because there's certain things that their body, their capacity does not have the ability to do. Now, in conjunction with that though, I do think that there's on the mound, you know, in the backfield, I guess you could say in the drill type of cues that we could be giving pitchers. Like one simple cue I give a pitcher and a quarterback is, hey, keep the stripe on your helmet or the logo on your hat vertical. Because what we've seen is that a lot of pitchers and a lot of quarterbacks that struggle with, you know, either shoulder injuries, elbow injuries, any anything down the chain, their helmet or their hat starts to teeter off to away from the throwing arm. So a nice simple cue that we've given to our throw athletes when they're inside of these controllable sort of like warm up pace throws is, hey, keep a vertical stripe, keep a vertical logo. So I think there's still some things that you can interject when you're throwing, but I do think that a lot of people are trying to get it all during the full speed drill. And it's like, you're asking the system to do something that it can't do. It'd be like, look, It'd be the same thing as showing somebody Goda and then saying, okay, go sprint like that. Like they can't sprint like a Goda. They don't have the capacity to. I've got to, I got to reverse engine. I got to take them back to the ground. I got to set the stage for them to build strength and awareness in those dormant areas and then progress them through the system. And then once that athlete is more inside ankle bone high, is more back chain dominant, the upper limb starts to get its ability to move like it should you'll see those qualities that you're looking for in your throw. They'll start to show up naturally without having to sort of, you know, exhaust yourself trying to cue them in actually repping the throw when the reality is you're usually just repping bad behavior over and over right. and over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and Chris, you were talking about earlier, the, you know, extreme isometric is, you know, earlier in the show. And, you know, like Ricky was saying, starting with, you know, the ISOs mm -hmm. and, that's what that's what I've done. I mean, I've taken our system and just, you know, implemented, you know, go to recode. But then, you know, when we're doing ISOs, it's in mm -hmm. go to theory. And it's like the, you know, I know Jay, you know, Jay, you know, got on to me a little bit on YouTube about that. You know, Jay, Jay didn't like the fact that I was changing ISO extremes a little bit. But, you know, when you apply theory, you know, theory of movement into the isometrics, then, I mean, just numbers skyrocket. And like, that's what we've seen. I mean everybody's numbers are just exploding all over the place mm. and they're healthier. So it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's I don't know if it's just the idea of, I, I feel like isometrics have been loved for decades. You know, I feel like if you look back to even some of Bruce Lee's early teachings about movement, he was huge mm -hmm. on the isometric game. Like I said, the Shaolin monks, the martial arts world was huge on isometrics and slow controlled movement. I don't know if, and I'm looking back on my time at 
not only Iowa, but pre-Iowa, like you're looking at the expansion of the Tendo unit. You're looking at the expansion of data early in, you know, maybe 2001, 2002, leading up to, you know, 2005, six, seven, eight, when I'm in college, where now we have this measurable data in the weight room where it's like, we didn't really have that before. It was like a chalkboard. Hey, you're going to hit the, the, you're going to hit the big three for three sets of eight, blah, blah, blah. Well, now you got this data and you got these computers and now you bring data, you bring computers into the weight room. And now they're in every single strength and conditioning weight room. And now you've got Tendo units. Now the Tendo units have units. Now those units have. And then you got guys like us. Well, going the opposite but when way. now you got these things to measure, you're like, well, the next question is how fast can I move it? Right? Like that's like the logical human, like it's like the Ricky Bobby, like how fast can it go? Like we just, that's how we are as humans. So I think we look at that and we're like, dude, strap that Tendo unit to the bar. Let's see how quick we can Olympic lift. So now it becomes this like, move it as fast as you can, right? Do it in this, this, like this one, because that's explosive. So if it's explosive, it'll translate to being explosive. Not saying that you shouldn't have that explosive component to your um, strength training regimens or your program, but you need to and should, and I think it's common sense and logical, like you're saying, John, where you kind of have to start with an isometric. Like it's, it's the same thing as if you took a paragraph and you threw it in front of a kindergartner and said, here, what does this say? He'd be like, what? No, you got to not only break it down to a sentence, then you got to break, you got to break it down to a word. You got to break it down to a letter. You have to start there and then you build from there to where they can see the cohesive paragraph. The same thing is done at Gota. You boil it down to the letter. You boil it down to, okay, what is inside ankle bone high? What is back chain dominance? What does it mean to have tail back crown forward? Let's install all that stuff. And when you're teaching your brain something new, when you're teaching it anything new, for that matter, not just movement, you go slow and you isolate things. It doesn't mean that you abandon a macro viewpoint. So I think it's, it's, it's important to, there's a macro view that you're always keeping in touch of, the 40,000 foot view. But there's also a microscopic view that you'll dive down into the eye of the storm and you'll look a little bit deeper into the details of how the Achilles tendon is sewn. The Achilles tendon being sewn and how it's organized with the calcaneus is honestly a very micro isolated sort of talk, but it's not abandoning the macro. It's only enhancing the macro. So I think if you don't have a macro and you're only dealing in micro, that's when things become a problem. Whereas if you have a macro, then you're more apt to, well, I need isometrics, but I also need fast movement and I need everything in between. Now, how I on-ramp the system, logically, I've got to assess that system. I have to bring awareness to that system. And then I have to slowly spoon feed that system because that's how the nervous system likes to learn. It doesn't like being waterboarded, so you can't do that to it. So I'll spoon feed it, as we would say, from all fours to a single leg. We know that if we spoon feed the nervous system from all fours to a single leg while bringing attention and detail and discipline to these specific global laws that we observed through all the durable humans, we start to see changes not only in the pain of our clients, but we see changes to their performance. The performance could be walking down to the end of the driveway. It could be throwing a fastball. It doesn't really matter. It's all the same stuff. It's a body. It's designed. It's the same hardware. It's designed to, to move a certain way. It doesn't matter which software program you're trying to run. So it's, it's a case of have a little bit of everything, but know where you've got to start and know where you want to start from and what you want to work to. Preach it, brother. I love it. Good info. Good stuff. Hey, you know what? If you ever need a second career, man, like <laughs> you could be a preacher. Like you got me fired up. Like I'm ready. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. It's well, it's one of those things. That I mean, you, you spend all day, every day thinking about how the damn Achilles is plugged into the calcaneus. And then it's yeah. like, you want to talk about it, you know what I'm saying? And so you got all these, yeah. these concepts and honestly, the toughest part about go and we, we hear it from a lot of people is dude, it go, it's like this, it go, it's so much that it just, it flies over the head because you're not, you have to reinstall, you know, like you have to reinstall how you're looking. Like, wait a second. What? It's not tripod foot. Okay. Well now I've got a, there's a lot of bones in the foot. There's a lot of things I got to break down for you there. There's a lot of concepts, but you can also look at it from these macro viewpoints. And when you start having these light bulb moments go off, which I know you've had, John, where it's like, wow, like this makes too oh, yeah. much sense. And I think 
you kind of have to sit there with your own thoughts and, and, and go back and forth and think about these things a little bit. Give them your, give them your time because one of the tough parts of GOTA is that we're saying, here's a whole new set of evidence. And it's like, I'm setting a stack of papers on your desk, essentially. And it's like, it's work to be done, but I promise that once you scathe through that stack of papers, you're coming on the out, you're going to go on the outside of that, that endeavor with a whole new outlook to how you're going to format the system and how you're going to format your training as a, as a coach. So for athletes or parents that want to do some recode work or want to connect with mm -hmm. you, where can um, they find so you? So go to go to movement.com. So that's our, that's our one-stop shop website. You'll find everything we have there. Um, we have really three main products that we offer. The first one is an entry level movement assessment. So if you're somebody that's like, well, how am I moving? Is it good? Is it bad? Or, Hey, I know I'm not moving good because I have, you know, these injuries piling up, go get a movement assessment. I take care of those movement assessments. So you'll be working with me directly. We'll basically show you what you're doing wrong and how we're going to go about fixing this from there. Our next uh, thing that we offer is an online uh, training website that's, you know, in conjunction with gotomovement.com. You can access it through gotomovement.com. But what we offer there is a 16-week recode program. So essentially, like we've been talking about, our recode program is designed to take you from all fours to a single leg. So through that process, you're going to be strengthening these qualities, these attributes of durability. And when you're starting to strengthen durability, you're going to notice that your pain goes away. You're going to notice you're stronger. You're going to notice you're faster. You got a little more wiggle to your movement. Um, you have a little more endurance to your movement. And we're going to make sure that you can progress A to Z step by step in a way that, like we said, spoon feeds the nervous system. So you've got 16 weeks to let the system kind of adapt to it. There are um, there's eight regimens total. We work each regimen for two weeks. And so inside of that 16-week program, you really start to change a, you know, rehabilitate yourself, get corrected. And then inside that same website or that training platform, there's a weekly performance workout. So ideally you're getting assessed, you're finding out what's wrong, you're starting your process, then you're going to finish and go through that recode program. And then you're going to finish with that weekly performance workout, which would be stuff like you see on, on, you know, coach John's website, or you see on go to movement page where you're doing some more challenging stuff, right? You're starting to get into some quicker movements, starting to get into some more challenging movements with a little bit of weight um, uh, loaded into the system. Um, and then kind of that last thing that we offer is the, really the, 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 the full deep dive of the education, which would be a coaching certification. So on, on our website, go to movement.com. Um, you can get your first workout for free by clicking, get your free guides. You can contact us if you have further questions. Um, but like I said, we have a movement assessment. We have a recode program um, and, a, and a comprehensive training platform that has correctives, education, uh, weekly performance workout. And then we have a, a full coaching certification that, you know, is 40 plus videos and PDFs and continuing education, a, a lab weekend app support. So there's a lot of stuff that's uh, available to you, but it's all centered on go to movement.com. Awesome. Awesome stuff, man. I appreciate you taking the time to come on and, um, you know, you guys have uh, really influenced what we do for sure. And, you know, we're going to continue to spread the message. So it's good stuff. I appreciate you being on. Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap Thank the you, show Ricky. up for today. So appreciate it. Guys, share the show. Y'all know the feed. Thank you, guys. All right, we appreciate love you guys. You. We appreciate you. Thanks for tuning in.